hello this one is about pre-darwinian developments okay the first unit of the evolutionary biology course so evolution as you know how do you define the evolution evolutionary biology the process of evolution so you, there are two accepted forms of def definitions one is at the micro level so the micro evolution is usually called it as a, a change in allele frequency of a population over generation or over time means time in the sense generation so merely by time alone for example my own life the moment i born and till now and in the future am i evolving uh, physiologically i might be evolving but at genetic level no you know so if the, the evolution should happen at the genome level you need to reproduce you know so there is a the main import the, the main idea of the evolution is that uh, you need to transmit to the next generation. So evolution happens not during one's lifetime, but over the evolution. So you might know about the coronavirus. Now that new variants are coming, right? Delta and so many other new, new variants are coming up. So how do they come up in our own lifetime? Because these are viruses and viruses have very short generation time. You know, even the bacteria itself is having very, very brief generation time in few minutes 10 minutes for e coli for example but for us uh, the generation time means uh, the time till you become a parent is pretty enormous right so that is why the uh, you know so those organisms with very brief generation time they tend to evolve much faster right so change in allele frequency allele by the way is uh, forms of the same gene you know in uh, a homologous chromosome so that is what you call it's allele uh, another uh, accepted uh, evolutionary definition the definition for the term evolution is descent with modification so if you have a, a a baby so baby is not exact copy of either of its parents right so there are modifications so that exactly that is exact what you call it as evolution so uh, the descent as you keep on going with the descent after descent, then there will be more and more modification accrued on. So that exactly is what you call it as evolution, you see. So with these two terms, there are two, uh, the terms like micro and macro becomes a lot more clearer to you. So microevolution is the, what you what happens within the population of the species, uh, like human uh, uh, population, for example, human species. So the population in the sense that, uh, you know, a uh, unit where uh, free reproduct reproduction happens. So, uh, you know, the genome, uh, genetic exchange happens. Panmictic population. Panmictic means free uh, mating. So ideally that kind of scenario is not applicable for human population because there are so many other uh, intricacies with our culture, right? For example, caste. Right, almost 99 percentage of marriages here in India happens within the caste. Beyond the caste or beyond religion, both are kind of not tolerated in culturally. Right, so uh, population in the sense that it's better if you can talk on other organisms like uh, bird. The population is uh, constrained with one geographically uh, constrained uh, unit where free exchange of genes happen. You know, so that is what the population is. So microevolution happens within that population, while macroevolution is at or above the species level. You know, so we are looking at the trends at a very long period in the case of macroevolution, right? But microevolution is more or less much faster rate, isn't it? So intraspecific or infraspecific within species. So these two terms can be used interchangeably. And population genetics is all about the study of the uh, how the population changes uh, by the by time. You know, uh, well, at the same time, macroevolution is at or above the species level and origin of new species, that is speciation, and lineage split or cladogenesis. Everything comes under the realm of the macroevolution. You see, so evolutionary mechanisms include mutation, migration genetic drift and natural selection of these are the four major mechanisms how uh, the species change over time you see uh, it could be mutation that is random accumulation of the genetic changes migration is mass movement of the population from one location to another location isn't it 
uh, it could be immigration that is incoming or emigration that is outgoing the two forms of the migration genetic drift is random sampling all because of the probability right so which of the allele gets incorporated into your gamete and which of the gamete will be fertilizing you see like if it's a sperm which which among the sperm is being fertilizing uh, with the the ovum all these are the the chance game so that exactly is what the genetic drift is all about uh, it's a purely mathematical concept right random sampling and then natural selection natural selection is non random survival of certain allele which are better suited to the environment you see adaptation play a major role in natural selection isn't it so now the question comes uh, with uh, uh, you know the how old the earth is so that is how that all questions on the evolution comes right it predates even the theory of evolution it, uh, by darwin for example this is a age old question how old the, the earth is right so from a scientific standpoint uh, the age of earth was essentially unknown till 19th century you see it's very recent right uh, uh, before that we have no clue so early ideas uh, for example if you look in the veda the, the classic hindu society they they thought that age is, the earth is really old you know so there is a, there is a very interesting number that is approximately 1.97 billion years and westerners ridiculed it it's not that old it's only around 6000 years that is what the christian theology believed you know so they limited the age of earth to a few thousand years that is exactly 6000 years approximately so that is what is written in the bible you see so biblical account of creation lasting in seven days so that is what in, within the span of seven days the entire earth was created by the god that is what uh, is written in the bible uh, in which which is uh, uh, equally followed by jews as well as christians you see so that is what we now call it as creation myth right it's a myth because the scientific evidence have invalidated it even pop himself have <laughs> claimed that it's uh, you know he himself have uh, accepted that it's a myth you see so based on the old testament 17th century vice chancellor of the cambridge university his name was john lightfoot uh, he calculated the exact uh, uh, the uh, you know the the year in which the earth is formed it is 4004 bc so bce you know before christ so this left little time for incredibly slow gradual process like evolution you see uh, yes so that is what uh, the westerners have been ridiculing the hinduism and our concepts but according to veda if you look cosmos is eternal and cyclic you know so creation of the universe is an, it's a mystery like black hole uh, it's a mystery they don't know but uh, cosmos is eternal and of course if you look at the, even the incarnations of lord vishnu uh, the, the famous the shavatara there are 10 incarnation right uh, that is what pictorially represented here it's very interesting that what the science now believe uh, you know how the evolution happened of course there is no belief in science but accepted uh, wisdom you know the, whatever the current evidence points out to is remarkably similar to the concept of the shavatara you know uh, for example the first incarnation is malsya that is fish then comes tortoise see uh, vertebrate evolved then tortoise and uh, that is reptile and then boar you know mammal so this is how the vertebrate evolution remarkably similar isn't it and then narasimha with this man lion this is uh, it's, it's not really scientific though but still vamana is a dwarf man and finally parashram that is a man with axe you know so it's kind of uh, similar to what the accepted wisdom of the evolutionary biology especially the vertebrate evolution you know very famous uh, british evolutionary biologist jbs haldane uh, you know he was a socialist and he had a soft corner towards india uh, he was in india for a long time you know uh, yes yeah, so he was in isi kolkata he spent many years there right jbs haldane and he's famously said that the shavatara surprisingly and truly depicts human evolution see 
so this is what I, I told you that this cyclic right uh, a form of uh, the geology or the earth uh, so that is exactly what is there in Vedas too if you look at that right so uh, the climatologists are also thinking the same way now so the you know uh, how do we have the weather or uh, how do we have this glacial cycle interglacial and glacier that is ice age or mini ice age and then comparatively warmer period called interglacial right now we are in an interglacial period you know so the reason for it is something called milankovitch cycle after russian geologist uh, rather astronomist so he is the first one who found that there are several processes, especially three processes involved that happens in cyclic nature. So for example, eccentricity changes in the orbital, you know, from uh, de departure from perf perfect cycle, right? Uh, perfect circle. So that is what the eccentricity. So eccentricity happens once in 100,000 years, 1 lakh years. Then obliquity of ecliptic yet another astronomical phenomenon that happens once in 41,000 years. And finally, the twist of our own axis of rotation. That is something called precession. That happens uh, around 26,000 years, once in 26,000 to 21,000 years. So this cyclic nature is exactly what is returning with us. So are this not science? Yeah, of course, it's not really science, but very, uh, very much similar to what science. So it is something like a proto science, isn't it? That is what is uh, uh, what has capti captivated several of the Western philosophers, uh, including J.B.S. Haldane and even Voltaire. You know, Voltaire was fascinated. He was completely against religion, but still he was quite fascinated with ancient uh, Vedic concepts of uh, the cyclic. Uh, uh, nature, no? In Vedas, it, it's called Pralaya and Mahapralaya, right? So that happens cyclically. That is exactly what is uh, what we now know. Uh, I mean, if you think that this is like a geological cycle, then definitely there is something interesting about it. Uh, but after Vedas comes Greek, uh, you know, the, the the formal science revolution, right? In the Greece, ancient Greece. But unfortunately, from there onwards. Uh, that concept in the Vedas have completely been, uh, you know, uh, eclipsed by Plato and Aristotle. But they were completely fallacious, what they found, especially when it comes to evolution. According to Plato, uh, you know, so living and non-living forms of Earth have imperfections from the ideal transcendental forms. These transcendental forms are the what? Designed by the God. You know, so whatever the variations we have are all imperfections of the ideal life. Uh, for example, if you look at a cat, you know, so according to Plato, cat has the ideal cat. Right? Cat is some <laughs> when the God created the cat. But whatever the cat you see are imperfections, you know, uh, from the norm, left and right, some kind of imperfections you can see. So variations are all imperfection, which is not good, you see. There is something called perfect essence, the pure beauty. This is what Plato's aesthesis, if you look at it. So horses, like any other species, are, have immutable divine essence, but individual horses have imperfections. So that is what the Plato's imperfections is all about, or essentialism. Now, coming to Aristotle, Aristotle was a student of Plato. Plato himself was a student of Socrates, you see. SPA, that is how the legacy is. So Aristotle's concept is quite similar, but uh, he went a step ahead and he started saying that is, uh, the species are immutable, so called fixed species concept. You know? So species are permanently fixed and do not evolve. So evolution doesn't happen. You know, So that is what uh, Aristotle's fixed species concept is. So uh, only forms exit, exist not individuals for example me or you do not exist these are just uh, uh, illusions only forms forms in the sense the the homo sapiens like human beings as uh, created by the god to exist but individuals are uh, illusions that is what he thinks 
So whatever individuals we are or the forms, we move towards the final cause or the purpose. So have you ever thought like what is the purpose of your life? As if there is a purpose, as if there is a there is something beyond your own life. You know, we are moving, we are marching towards that final purpose. That is called teleology in philosophy. Teleology. That is goal oriented. So we are born with a purpose and we are simply marching towards that purpose. That exactly is the Aristotelian concept is. But you know, of course, that is an illusion, you see, mind it. So we are walking towards a purpose is a teleological argument. Teleology itself is a cognitive fallacy. You know? So earth is only 6,000 years old. That is what the biblical myth is all about, isn't it? So this has been uh, criticized by Voltaire. Voltaire is a French enlightenment philosopher of, uh, I guess he was in 16th century. He has written a very nice satire uh, called Candide. Candide is a very small book, novella rather. And the protagonist of the Candide is Dr. Pangloss. And Pangloss is a very interesting uh, philosopher. And he was hopelessly optimistic. So according to him, everything has got a purpose and we are living in, uh, you know, the best of possible worlds. The best world in the universe is where the earth is. That is what the Panglossian view, you know. So through Panglos, what I was criticizing other philosophers, including all the way up to Aristotle and Plato, you know, but directly he was criticizing uh, uh, you know, uh, Gottlieb Wilhelm Leibniz, the German philosopher, and according to the, the Leibniz, uh, this is the best of all possible world. We are living in the planet Earth, you know. So the fixed species concept of Aristotle is exactly what is being portrayed in the Bible, creationism, you know. So if you look at the book of Genesis, the first book of the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Old Testament, that is what is being featured there, the creationist myth, right? So how the biodiversity of Earth has been created by the God in a matter of just seven days, you know? So individually created by the God, that is something called scala naturae of the Aristotle. Uh, that is the, the great chain of being from inanimate object all the way to the human being, you see? And finally into the angels, you see? But this creation is nothing but a myth. You see that it's uh, it has been criticized all the way back, back by Bertrand Russell, the famous British philosopher of thought. Uh, you know, this uh, kind of thing, the making sense of the world or life events, even your own birth have got a deeper meaning or things happen for a reason or living and non-living things are there for a purpose. So that is, I told you, that is a teleological worldview. So in one sense, it is connected with anthropocentrism too. Human-centered universe, the entire universe has a purpose because the entire universe or the planet Earth is created for the whole purpose of human being. Completely, uh, you know, uh, discounting the, the very existence of other plants and animals and microbes. That is incorrect, isn't it? So Russell famously said, religion is based I think primarily and mainly upon fear. It's partly the terror of the unknown and partly, as I have said, the wish to feel that you have a kind of an elder brother who will stand by you for all your troubles and disputes. A good world needs knowledge, kindliness and courage. It doesn't need regretful hankering after the past or a fettering for the free intelligence by the words uttered long ago by ignorant men. You see the star criticism of Bertrand Russell. By the way, there are around 10,000 religion, established religion on the planet Earth. Each of these religion, 10,000 religion, criticize each other. And they say that our God is the best God, you know. And each of these religion do have some or other form of creation that the God created uh, the, the plants and animals and the whole world for the sole purpose of human being. Exceptions are some uh, ancient uh, religion, pantheistic religion. You know, pantheism means more than one God, isn't it? 
especially pagan pagan really like shintoism or hinduism right where animals also have got the the god essence inanimate objects too stones too you know for example so illusions coming to illusions uh, do you know even sunrise and sunset many people think that seeing is believing it is not only through objective reality you know to know the objective factor objective reality you need principles of science friends uh, for example even sunrise and sunset is not real you know it's nothing but uh, you know, it's an it's an illusion because sun neither rises or sets. It's the planet Earth moving, isn't it? So seeing is not really real. You know, you don't really have to see it to believe it. For example, electron. Have you seen electron? No one has seen electrons. Yet, without electron, you won't be able to watch my videos like this, isn't it? Uh, or a sets of the the cultural ramification for example if i portray this kind of uh, uh, you know world map you will e easily criticize me oh no this is incorrect you look at that australia right on the top no it's inverted the real world map is different this is the real world map isn't it? the corrected world map with the india is like this right south and north while here it's like uh, you know south india becomes on the top <laughs> friends even the map itself is illusion, you know. So there is no harm in this map. This both these maps are perfectly fine. Have you ever thought of it? This itself is because of our cultural legacy. There are cultural biases in it. This map is uh, what has been uh, promulgated by Britishers, the imperial colonialist, isn't it? So that they want to portray the England as a center of the world. And whatever is on the top, they are more, more bureaucrat or leaders or boss on the top, you know. Any kind of organizational hierarchy, uh, for example, here in this university, usually the vice chancellor or the chancellor are, are, are right on the top, while entry level workers are right on the bottom, isn't it? So any, any organization structure you see, the CEOs will be the top. So the top is always on the top. You see, the, the whoever is the control, the leader is always portrayed on the top. And that is, uh, you know, that that is uh, that, that co cognitive implication have got deep evolutionary legacy as well. Even chimpanzees have that same mentality. Whatever is written on the top or image on the top, uh, even chimps think that it is really uh, more powerful. So that is the reason why the the uh, you know the the north up uh, map like this is become very popular because of the imperial legacy friends this is also perfectly normal because if you go beyond planet earth like in iss for example in, you know international space station or much beyond uh, like in moon uh, if you look at the planet earth uh, it, it makes no sense the direction makes no sense from the space there is no south or north in space, you know. There are only two things in space, in and out. In to, uh, you know, a, a planetary field of gravity, a gravitational field, or out of it, you know. So north or south or east or west doesn't make any sense. So, not, you know, this is south up. South up is also perfectly fine, scientifically is accurate. So sunrise and sunset are nothing but merely illusions. But we never knew that, you know. So it was, uh, we commonly attribute this to the Copernicus, right, the Italian astronomer. So pre Copernican worldview was geocentrism, where uh, Earth is the center of the, the whole universe and everything, all planets and stars, you know, and constellations are the world. You know, the, the, the sun is the center, and all the planets and its moons are uh, revolving around the sun. So, this is what the company has said. Of course, uh, it was a by the religious establishment. And later, Bruno, you might know, the Bruno was a very famous astronomer. He simply supported Copernicus, and because he supported and he criticized the Bible, do you know what kind of punishment Bruno got? He was burned alive by the Catholic Church. So, the first person who ever 
suggested that the easy to spot the patterns and connections between the patterns like a smiley or if you look at the, uh, the sound you can see a face or a rabbit if you twist it it's a it's a moon rabbit isn't it so do you know this even the moon moon the craters have got the names one of this crater the name is Aristarchus named after Aristarchus or even Copernicus and Galileo all these are the names of it so objectivism is seeing is not believing you know, that is what the illusions are, right? So you don't have to see to believe, you know? So for example, scientists knew that we don't, we will not feel uh, any weight when you go to the space or, or space is pitch dark, you know, or, or space has no air much earlier than uh, Yuri Gagarin. He is the first the Russian cosmonaut, right? He was in uh, 1961. So again, I told you, no one has seen electron but we all know that it, it, it works, isn't it? So objective reality exists outside the human consciousness. And only way to know is by using the scientific methodology. First. So that is how the Nicholas Copernicus have uh, uh, did it. So he falsified. So falsification, by the way, is the conjecture you refute it by uh, falsifying. And that new theory can become a conjecture to become refutation again so conjecture refutation the cycle continues so that is what drives the scientific revolutions you know so Copernicus falsified the Ptolemaic geocentrism by scientific methodology and put forth the theory of heliocentrism and now heliocentrism itself was falsified uh, by later uh, you know Kepler for example and other uh, uh, astronomers uh, later on so heliocentrism itself, I told you, it was not by uh, Copernicus, it was by Aristarchus way back in 280 BC, but not supported by Greek authorities. But he didn't have to suffer the ridicule because Greeks are a lot more tolerant, uh, not like much later in Italy and the uh, rest of the Europe. Uh, you know, if you criticize religion uh, during the Middle Ages, you know, uh, it's it's treated as blasphemy you know so heliocentric theory was successfully revived early uh, uh, nearly after 1800 years by copernicus after which kepler described planetary motions with greater accuracy uh, that is something called kepler's laws and then isaac newton gave theoretical explanation based on laws of gravitational attraction and dynamics later einstein's uh, special theory of relativity and general theory later you know special theory is the first and general theory comes right all these things are how the science progress so scientific methodology is logical rational systematic reproducible empirical and evidence-based methodology to test a hypothesis in question why am i saying about scientific methodology because darwinism is science you know so that differentiation of what science is and what is not science or rather anti-science or pseudoscience is really important so scientific methodology involves observations, experiments, and statistical hypothesis testing. It need not involve everything together, you know, but still, usually it, it involves. So proving or disproving, that is the principle of falsifiability uh, by the Karl Popper, the British philosopher of science, right? And later, another theory is by Thomas Kuhn's paradigm shift. We introduced all these concepts, right? Paradigm shift is... Uh, not linear, uh, you know, it is, is uh, it's a revolution, right? Once in a time, like uh, 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 serendipitous discoveries, right? Not really lab-oriented study, but uh, uh, Karl Popper's falsifi falsifiability is more predictable. 
and statistics plays a crucial role, right? So, uh, yes, so it is all started from Francis Bacon's Novum Organum, same guy who criticized his religion, see, Novum Organum, based in, uh, it was published in 1620, Novum Organum means new organum, the organum itself is uh, from the Greek, Greek philosophers, you know, so, yeah, so that is uh, what it is. And now Hitchens Razor, that is, uh, you know, it's, uh, two of the thumbs rules for the scientific methodologies, Hitchens Razor and Sagan Standard, very famous. Hitchens Razor after, uh, you know, the Hitchens, the popular science uh, writer, right, Christopher Hitchens. What can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. If you're saying something works without any evidence, like a theory of creativity, uh, what is the evidence you have because it's written in a holy book? No, that is not evidence, right? So whatever can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. That is what Hitchens Razor is about. That exactly captures a scientific methodology. And Carl Sagan, very famous astronomer and popular science writer. Uh, his standard is extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidences. If you are making extraordinary claim like Earth is the center of universe, or uh, you know, hu or human being is the top of evolutionary ladder, uh, or uh, ladder, or other animals have been created by the God, all these kind of things. If you are making these kind of claims, it's your responsibility to prove it, to substantiate your claims with host of evidences. You know. So that is what the Carl Sagan standard, Sagan standard is. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. You know, that, that sums up the whole biostatistics, you see. So geocentrism and anthropocentrism are also pretty related. Geocentrism means Earth is the center of universe. And why? The rationale is that we are living on the planet Earth. And the, this is my our world, you know. And we want to say that the, this world where we are living is very special, you know. So this is the universe. Everything is surrounding us. So that is what geocentrism. Geocentrism is wrong. It's a fallacious. And historicus first then Copernicus have disproved it. We are not the center of the universe. There's, there's nothing special about planet Earth. We are just uh, one planet in the solar system. And solar system itself is just one planetary system in vast expanses of a galaxy. We are not even in the center of the galaxy. The center is a black hole, you know, a galaxy called Milky Way. That itself is just one among countless number of galaxies in this observable universe, you know. So it's quite similar to anthropocentrism. Human being is a center of the universe. The whole universe is created only for the benefit of homo, homo sapiens, a human being. What is the rationale? We are human beings, right? And you deserve a privileged position among other living beings. That is what you call it as anthropocentrism, which is a fallacious worldview, which is quite related to a cognitive bias called confirmation bias. So confirmation bias is you are looking for evidences to substantiate what is already known, already what you believe in. You already believe that human being, we are the human being and we are really special, you know. And for example, I'm born in Kerala. And I want to feel that, oh, Keralaites, Malayalis are the best, you know, very good with literacy, very good with the uh, 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 standard of living, whatever we you know in the world. We are very special. Which is wrong, you know, that mentality is wrong. Or the, ca the caste which I'm born, you know, I was born in a Brahmin caste. And we are top of the world, you know, we are the most intelligent creatures. Again, wrong, fallacious. So whatever be, uh, um, you're justifying, you're looking for evidences to substantiate. I told you one example when we discussed about cognitive bias, this uh, confirmation bias. Uh, if you are a vegetarian, I'm a vegetarian, by the way. You look for evidences to substantiate vegetarianism. For example, plants are good for planet, or uh, you know, uh, you, uh, you know the uh, plant plant life. If you are actually, uh, uh, if you are a vegetarianist, it's more ethical, you know. So, yeah. So that kind of looking for evidences to substantiate what you already believe is true is called 
confirmation bias. So both of these are confirmation bias, anthropocentrism and geocentrism, you see. So yeah, that is uh, how it is, right? The anthropocentrism which is connected with how the creation myth started. So what Darwin came here is quite similar to what Aristarchus did for disproving the geocentrism. What Darwin did is he disproved anthropocentrism. He has just one animal. So in one sense, like Aristarchus of Samoa, uh, you know, uh, much before Darwin, anthropocentrism has already been disproved by, for example, pagan system like Shinto system in Japan, where Amaterasu Omikami, the plant, uh, you know, the the, the sun uh, is a, a grand god. If you go to Japan, you know, even uh, mountains and rivers uh, all have, uh, you know, the divine essence. Uh, in one sense, that is the same thing that Veda also do, right? In, in India, Indian Hindu Hindu philosophy uh, depicted in Vedas are quite similar to Shinto or Egyptian uh, Kemeticism, you know. So all these pagan traditions are kind of anti-anthropocentric. So that is the essence of the Darwinism too that we will see that. So next we will see intellectual stepping stones towards the theory of Darwinism.